Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. This is part two of our May Q&A. If you missed the first part, definitely go back and check that one out. But this is part two, and let's get into the second half of the questions that you guys asked us. All right, next question is from Nagura. Sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, Tim made me do this one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Can you explain uh, in more detail what XMP is, I suppose? Well, XMP stands for Extreme Memory Profile, and that is extreme with an E, not an X. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, it was developed by Intel back in the DDR3 days to help users fine-tune their memory uh, with just a one-click button type solution because otherwise you have to go through where you have to first set the frequency and then the timing. And it's a bit confusing because people don't know what timings work at what frequency. And so basically, it's a way for Intel and the memory makers to take all that guesswork out for you guys. So rather than have to follow certain timings at certain frequencies, you just load the XMP profile, hits the maximum timings at the designated frequency. But without XMP, so I suppose in the dark days of DDR2, uh, when we didn't have XMP profiles, by default the memory would just boot up at a really safe profile, so a sort of a default specified profile with very relaxed timings at a lower frequency, and that was just to ensure compatibility so that the system would actually boot up. But if you've bought premium memory designed to work above spec, which I suppose most of you guys do, uh, spending half an hour in the BIOS making sure that all the settings are correct really isn't ideal. So XMP was created to significantly reduce the time and uh, experience required to maximize your memory performance. All right, next question is from Apollo. Uh, Could you say why my laptop GTX 1054 gigabyte thermal throttles at 60 degrees? Uh, does this affect performance? If so, what could I f do to fix it? Yeah, so your laptop probably shouldn't be thermal throttling at 60 degrees. Mm, seems very low. Yeah, discrete laptop GPUs should work fine all the way up into the mid-80s. That's fairly typical for a sort of gaming laptop or any discrete That's cool GPU. for a laptop almost. Yeah, I mean, laptop CPUs run like yeah. 100 degrees. So, yeah, I guess the way that GPU boost works is that, you know, the more temperature headroom you have, the more mm. likely it is to boost into those sort of higher frequency ranges. So you might be seeing less performance there, but 60 degrees is still pretty cool there. Yeah. Uh, I think though, if you are getting thermal throttling legitimately and you're worried about performance, you can always open up the laptop if you can and apply better, better thermal paste to the GPU, even liquid yeah. metal, because um, laptop manufacturers really do uh, skimp a little bit on their on their cooling paste. Well, yeah, it'd be interesting to know what model laptop it is. So yeah. you can know if there is actually a, some sort of extreme limit there. Because yeah, as you say, 60 degrees is very cool. So yeah, knowing the model could help. And also, have you tried installing something like MSI Afterburner with Reaver Tuner to actually monitor not just the temperature while gaming, but also the frequency to know if it is. Yeah, make but, sure it's working properly. Yeah, yeah. so interesting to see how you, you uh, are monitoring if it is throttling or not. You seem yep. confident that it is, but be interesting to know what frequency it's actually running at under those conditions. Next question is from I'm Crazy PVP. Cool. I have a Ryzen 5 1400 and was thinking of getting a new Ryzen 2600X. I also have an Asus Prime B350 Plus motherboard. So should I upgrade or wait for Zen 2? Okay, um, yeah. Will, will you give us your thoughts, Tim. Tell us what uh, you think. Well, I think the Ryzen 5 1400 is still pretty capable. And if you're not using something like a GTX 1080 Ti, you're probably still getting the most out of your graphics card with that CPU. <laughs> That's fair to say. Um, the 2600X, yeah, it's a great CPU, but for gaming, you probably won't mo notice much of a difference. So I guess you'd probably want to wait for a more substantial upgrade. But then again, I guess you, if you're using productivity workloads, you might get a bit more out of the 2600X. I was just about to say, yeah, it really comes down to what you want to do with the system because the 1400, perfectly good gaming CPU still, especially if you're only using a mid-range graphics card, as Tim said. So, yeah, if you want to boost in productivity, then you will see quite a nice boost with the 2600X, but then you also want to make sure you have good memory to take advantage of it. So, yep. yeah, depends on what memory you have now, I suppose. Next question is from Abdullah. Oh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Is RAM ever going to go down in price? Uh, yeah, one day it certainly is. Uh, I... Let's let's uh, do a prediction here. I predict the first quarter of 2019. There you go. All right. I, I predict never. I reckon it'll stay flat okay. for, or roughly flat. And then the next generation of products will come out and maybe from there we'll see some drops. But I think we were seeing rises for a long time and now it's sort of flattened out. And I think manufacturers don't really like to make things cheaper. So I'm holding out on it uh, just staying the same. 
And I also predict that the comment section now hates Tim. <laughs> Uh, this question is from Emerald. Do you ask manufacturers for reviewing samples or do manufacturers ask you to review them? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, sometimes we request a product, particularly if it's something that you guys are asking us to check out, either ahead of time or if it's released. Uh, some things we don't really review much, like cases, keyboards and mice. So I might do them on unboxing boxes. But generally, we're pretty well flooded with offers to check out new hardware uh, on a daily basis. So sometimes we're like, yeah, we're probably not going to have time to get to that. But obviously if it's CPU, GPU related or a new laptop or something like that, we'll jump on that. So yeah, it's nice to get our hands on that stuff as it comes out. Yeah, and I think with some companies, especially the CPUs and GPU sort of thing, there's just an understanding between us and the companies that both of us want each other to well, yeah, that's, yeah. work together on those products. So it's really, really easy for those sort of products to be reviewed by us. No, no problems there. Yeah, so what Tim is basically saying is when NVIDIA release a new graphics card, we just sit tight, wait, and I'll send out an email and say, all right, we're releasing the new GPU in two weeks' time, and here's the NDA, sign that, and we'll send one out. Yeah, easy. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good to us. All right, this next question is from M. Just, just M for now. Uh, which side will have the first X499, red or blue? Ah, oh, boy. Um, well, I'm going to have to assume AMD because, you know, second gen Threadripper, we've already seen that that's sort of out there, so it can't be too far away. But yeah, as I said earlier, these chipset names are just getting absolutely stupid. I have no idea where Intel's high-end desktop platform is going from here. But yeah, if they change to something else and then AMD copies that, it's probably grounds for being sued there. Uh, and not to mention, it's just getting ridiculous for, you know, the buyers. Yeah, so. it's terrible. But anyway, I think AMD will win that one, and then I don't know where Intel goes from there. All right, this question is from Mustafa. Will we see an APU from AMD that is more powerful than the Ryzen 5 2400G, or will we wait until they build it on second gen plus a better Vega GPU inside? Okay, uh, yeah, I've had a few people ask me this, so I've had a bit of time to think about it, and I doubt it at this point. Uh, the issue isn't so much can they put a more powerful GPU inside an APU, because uh, they 100% can. The issue is that doing it won't really yield any extra performance, as even the 2400G is memory bandwidth limited, and we see that when comparing it to the 2200G when both of them are overclocked. So until they can increase the memory bandwidth, and we spoke about DDR5 earlier, uh, it's unlikely that we'll see any beefier APUs. Yeah, and right now the die that they use for those APUs has is fully unlocked in terms of its GPU and its CPU. So yeah, yeah, yeah it'd it have to be a whole new silly yeah, yeah new they, silicon. They could either bump up clock speeds, which seems unlikely, or they'd have to make a new chip, and that's mm -hmm. probably not going to happen at this point. No. Uh, this question is from Need a Better Name. Is there an actual noticeable difference from 60 hertz to 144 plus? All TV and movies are filmed at less than 40 FPS, even YouTube caps at 30. Mm. Um, yeah, so YouTube, you can actually get 60 FPS from yeah, YouTube. this video so will be 60 FPS. And yeah, most TV and movies are either like 24 or, 4 or 30 FPS. Mm. But there is a big difference between 60 and 144 hertz. Like 60 FPS Massive. is pretty smooth as yep. it is. But the, the jump in fluidity to 144 hertz, not just for gaming, but also just, you know, browsing around Windows, scrolling it's, it's web browsers. It's day and night, yeah. Yeah, it, it really is day and night. And it's only until you use one of those monitors that you really understand that sort of difference in, in smoothness. So, yeah, it's a really big difference. You don't really notice as much with films because we're all used to watching films at 24 FPS. Yeah, so yep. You re and even YouTube videos and all that, you don't really notice it. But when you're gaming and you're like making movements and it's all you know reacting to what you're doing that's obviously the yeah. big one yeah. yeah and as you say it's like it enhances the windows experience like get a chrome window and like scroll down on a 60 hertz panel and you think oh that's not too bad then you're on a 144 hertz and it's yeah, like it's crazy so much smoother okay so this question is from sayesh hopefully i got that right how much time and effort does it go into making a mega benchmark video steve quite a bit uh yeah, so not to sound arrogant or anything like that, but it is just, it really is way too much time and effort. So I don't imagine that you'll see too many other content creators making those types of videos. You've really got to just be sick in the head and love doing it. <laughs> um, I spent about 50 hours benchmarking for that last 36 game head to head, and then about another 16 hour day creating the graphs, the B-roll and all the editing that goes into making those sort of videos. Uh, so it is a massive undertaking. I really do enjoy making them though, uh, and I love seeing how the hardware compares in a wide range of games. 
All right, another question from Saesh. Can I overclock a Ryzen 2600 to 4.2 gigahertz using a stock cooler? Uh, no. No, I'd say not unless you live in a freezer, that won't be possible. I think uh, from memory based on the day one review, I did test that. I think it was four gigahertz is pretty much the limit with the stock cooler. And even then things do get a bit toasty. Yeah. Uh, there are some good coolers anyway for $20 US or less, uh, like the Gamax 200T. I really like that one. That often sells for like $10 or $11 US on Amazon. So go check that out. All right, this question is from James. Have you tried overclocking the GN Mod Mac yet? I heard rumors about him bidding press samples for top performance. Oh, Steve wouldn't do that, surely? Not, not Steve. No, he's too genuine for that. But for those of you who don't know what the Mod Mat is, here it is. So there. Just blocking me right out. I'm just behind there you. There you go. How good does that look? Much better picture now. <laughs> Be careful of my mod mat. Don't crease it. All uh, right. So yeah, Steve and his underhanded tactics with the media. So this is something I have wanted to touch on. Uh, but yeah, I have found quite amazing performance with the uh, mod mat at about 1.45 uh, volts. Oh really? I was speaking to Long Hair Steve though, and he got a bit upset about that. He said me that that he said that much voltage will start to degrade the mat, so he suggested winding that down. But I think he's a bit concerned that you know the other non cherry picked mats probably won't get to those voltages, and if I start yeah, reporting yeah. that, then you. Yeah, people will know that they've been cherry picking the mod mats. Enough silliness. I don't really care about overclocking the mod mat. That's not why I have the mod mat. I want my RGB light add-ons. And so release them, Steve. I want one at the top and one at the bottom. Yep. Okay, this question is from Kenny. Is Oh, geez, all right. Let me give that one another <laughs> shot. This next question is from Kenny. Second time lucky doing the, reading this question. Is Ryzen really future-proof in gaming? Should we try 720p results as an indicator of it? Ryzen 1600 slash 2600 versus i5-8400. Uh, okay, well, it, it's really impossible to say right now because we... We don't know what the future is going to hold. Uh, depends on games and many other things like that. Uh, but it should do very well under 100% load because we've seen that it does in other workloads. And the FX series, they don't really do that well under 100% load for various reasons, mostly down to how it's designed. Uh, as for 720p, well, I, I do like those results. And basically what they do is they tell us exactly how these CPUs perform in games right now. We're not GPU limited. So that's really important. If you're just testing the games we have today under GPU limited conditions, then it doesn't really tell you how the CPU might behave if the sections of the game that do become really heavy on the CPU where you'll see slowdown. So the 720p results are good for that. And also if you happen to upgrade your GPU, so a lot of people say, oh, you know, you test with the 1080 Ti and I don't use that, but you might buy a 1080 or maybe even a 1080 Ti in a year's time or two years time secondhand, or you might keep your CPU for the next three years and then buy a GPU in three years time that's way more powerful than a 1080 Ti. And then it would be really interesting to know how your CPU yeah. had, had stacked up at 720p when it wasn't GPU limited. So by, you just don't want to mask the performance and say, oh, look, they all, they're much the same. Here's some 4K results. It just doesn't, it's not informative yeah. and doesn't tell you anything. So, okay, last question here, probably going to be a quick one. It's from Spectre. Does B360 motherboard support 3,000... Oh, it's actually 3,200 memory. It's not 3,200 megahertz. That's fine. I'll let it slide. Do the B360 motherboards support 3,200 memory? That is the question. And... Well, the answer is no. Well, yeah, the answer they do, is... Yeah. Well, they do support the sticks, but not at 3,200 speeds. So you'd I be think limited that's, yeah, to, important yeah, to say. You'd be limited to 2,666 or 2,400. Yes, that's right. So it depends on the CPU. So the Core i5s and i7s work at 2666. That's what you'll be locked at. And I think the Core i3s and lower are 2400. So you can install any memory above that spec. Uh, the disadvantage though will be when you load the XMP profile, it'll be loading timings for that higher frequency. So you will want to possibly look at a guide to tighten up those timings. It doesn't really affect Intel CPUs too much, but there will be a little bit of extra performance to be had there by tightening those timings up. And that's it for this month's Q&A video. Thanks to everyone who submitted us questions throughout all our various channels. We really appreciate it. Definitely go back and check out part one of this video if you haven't already. And I guess, Steve, uh, we'll catch you next month for another Q&A. Definitely. We'll see you again next time.